one of the things, I understand what, Krista, you said about um, this may not be wise to talk to your friends, but something in me is saying that that is a fear that I'm not going to be clear, therefore I should not say anything until I'm clear. And I feel that whether it's a car mechanic or you or my friend or a stranger that walks down the street, ideas are to be shared whether they seem to be clear or not. You know, I've been learning from my friends also in, in attempting to let go of the fear of how I communicate by just saying to them, look, I'm going through something and I'm not clear about it right now, but I feel very strongly about where I'm going. But we have to get back to your original point, which was you want to be able to freely share the ideas. Exactly, Dave. Well, and, and what I'm saying is, if I hold back from those people, I may be holding back from lessons that I need to learn about where I am. This is bringing me to some clarity. Well, and if I it. only come here to share, I'm not going to be, a, I can't get as clear, because I do have that life out there. You know, I'm not going to just be, this is not my only life. You're, con you're convinced even that you're breaking apart this from that life. What I want to say is that, that the whole idea is that Jesus is the one that performs miracles through us. And that he, at one point in the text, he says that, that, the, that the partly sane are apt to look very foolish at times. Of course, the partly sane are not always in their right mind. They're, they will seem to vacillate between their right mind and wrong mind, and they're going to look like fools in the world's eyes because they're teaching inconsistently. Yes, it's like teaching one thing and then turning around and teaching another. Now, what I see when he says, let me be the one to tell you which miracles to perform is the sense that he knows where they can be received. That that's how the chain of atonement gets welded together, he says, is, is by, as miracle workers, we, first of all, we have to be, even just for a moment, in our right mind, because miracles cannot be performed in a spirit of doubt or fear. So that's, that's the main condition for miracles, which is a, it's a big condition right off the bat to just even for a moment to be in your right mind. And then the second thing is that he knows where that they are to be bestowed. That he says, I am the only one who can perform miracles indiscriminately because I am the atonement. That for those that are teachers of God in training, so to speak, or aspiring to be miracle workers, that it's going to look foolish at times if you still think as a person that you can spread the mustard over Jesus, I'm going to spread it over here. I got a friend, Kathy, I got one, Susan, I got Steve, I got Marcy, I, and I'm just going to spread the mustard around and make sure that everybody gets a piece of it. And, he, you know, at times, there are times when clearly it's not, there's not a receptiveness, like Chris was kind of getting at, I think, from, from people. A lot of times, it, it was, it can be an attack but once again, an attack would be, I must be in my wrong mind, or I must be trying to run the show as my little self, instead of asking Jesus, is, is this a situation where, where I can be helpful? Would you, would you have me say something or do something here? Mm -hmm. It really is a surrender to that. And to me, that gets it away from all those ego things about, well, I should be able to apply it as much and say as much in this group, in this situation, as this one, this one, this one, this one, because then it gets into a form thing. If I should, if I can share my feelings in this group, then why can't I share my thoughts and feelings, you know, here, 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 here? It still gets back into that trying to, to spread it around and do the same thing everywhere. And maybe there's a bit of a sense in there, too, of um, just a concept of myself that says, you know, I speak my mind wherever I am, whoever I'm with. And if, if that's the way I've constructed my false identity, then, 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 I, yeah, then I'm going to, you know, think that I'm going to have to continue to do that. And it's going to be hard to lay that one aside and just, you know, as David said, recognize that Jesus knows the readiness and Jesus performs the miracle. And, you know, that's going to have to be put aside in order for for something greater to shine through. Amen.
part to you the miracle cannot seem natural because what you've done to hurt your mind has made it so unnatural that it doesn't remember what it's natural to, to what is natural to it and when you are told what is natural you can't understand it the recognition of the part as whole and of the whole in every part is perfectly natural for it is the way god thinks and what is natural to him is natural to you Holy natural perception would show you instantly that order of difficulty in miracles is quite impossible, for it involves a contradiction of what miracles mean. And if you could understand their meaning, their attributes could hardly cause you perplexity. You've done miracles, but it's quite apparent that you've not done them alone. You've succeeded whenever you've reached another mind and joined with it. When two minds join as one and share one idea equally, the first link in the awareness of the sonship as one has been made. There's a part in here. That had talked about I guess this isn't the part about um confusing the miracle. impossible to convince you of the reality of what has clearly been accomplished through your willingness while you believe that you must understand it or else it's not real? I don't know. But I sense too and when you're talking about whether it's your family or your friends and I really had to I struggled with this immensely because I, I felt like well if I should I could be at peace, I should be able to be at peace anywhere and I should be able to have the same friends that I've always had and on and on and on. It should be able to work that way. And what underneath, I really had to get in touch with where my, where the problem was, was I had laws of friendship part of, that were part of my specialness. You know, I believed, I knew what friends were. I would talk at Waynesville a little bit about all the different variations of, of friendships and family and everything. It was like a, there was a hierarchy in there. And it's clear that however you want to look at it, whether it's just loving everyone equally, that it, that is a very radical, different idea than the way this hierarchy is constructed. Like you were mentioning when you even brought it up to your friends, like, well, I have dear memories of these people, and I and there are my husband and my friends. I can't see them, and why would I even want to see them? Is the same as everyone else. I mean, this whole world is built on those hierarchies. And, you know, the mind, the ego is protest when, when you even would begin to question or start to even loosen up on the hierarchies a little bit. Just to even begin to question because that's, its whole thing of specialness is based on that. It's based on the fact that the ego says, you've been able to have these special relationships and you have got some joy and happiness and comfort from them. You know, it's, it, it, it's its own version. It says it certainly hasn't been all the time, but there have I been no like moments. I've created them. Why would I want to uncreate them? I have created those special relationships. Now, why do I want to uncreate those special relationships? Yes. And it's that thing of create versus make, because I know... A lot of times when you're talking, like, I'm creating this guilt in Steve or in myself. Or I'm creating guilt when I'm feeling like I'm not being financially responsible. The thing that I've noticed, and we brought this up over and over and over in groups and in the intensive, was this thing about create and make. That's, that's where you start getting into away from the, the right mind as a reminder that, that creation is the mind's function and that creation is not of this world, that it's, the Father created the Son, the Son has creations, it's all spirit. When I think that I have created anything of havoc, any problems, pain, misery, that in a sense is saying, I believe in sin. Because there's a sense that the create is a very important thing, and, and there's a permanence to it. And, and therefore, there seems to be these these things in my life, my conflicts and so on and so forth, don't seem to be errors or mistakes. They seem to have much more weight to them. Like they're there, they're con they're in concrete and everything. And to me, it's, that's, a, that's a differentiation I've had to get much more clearer about. I made this. I made this up. 
what did I make up? Any situation that I can think of or the cosmos in general. It helps me to also remember to look closely at the tense of, of made, made, past tense. Because if it's make or am making, I'm taking my I am, my pure I am, and I'm putting making, I am creating this pain, I am creating this guilt, I am, you know, then there, it's linking that I am, it's linking that that true creative ability that I have with something in the world of form. It's unreality. Yeah. Yeah. And the secret of salvation is real simple. I have done this thing, and it is this that I would undo. The first part is essential because if if I'm still projecting out the blame on all these other people, if I'm feeling helpless, powerless, victimized by something that has been done to me completely apart from my mind, completely apart from my will, I had no hand in this at all, I didn't ask to be dealt this hand or whatever, then the mind's like closed. There is no way that I can even begin to accept salvation. But the first step is I of the secret is I have done this thing and then I can't stop there because oh if I stop there, stop there I'm guilty. that is guilty right and so it is this that I would undo in other words if I can see that I have done it and it's, it's past tense then there's an opening for for the present moment to, to move into the present to, to see from the present moment is where my innocence is there is no way that I can identify with what has been done in the past and not feel guilty. Because the past is the time of guilt. That is the unholy instance when guilt and fear and terror reign. But but it keeps coming back to, I, in the present, I am innocent. And so as we keep going into things more and more, we have to start to come to see that, that as long as I keep ordering the illusions, as long as I keep making hierarchies, as long as I keep judging, it is impossible for me to, to perceive myself in the present or to perceive myself in the miracle. And that's the central thing we have to start to come to, to come to from all the different angles we come to. I have to be able to see that as long as I'm judging, as long as I'm making hierarchies and arranging specialness out here, attached to certain things, indifferent to some, hating some, however I construct that, that I cannot be in the present or I cannot be in the miracle of just seeing the past as the past. If I judge, I'm in the wrong mind and it's like I'm in it. I'm, I'm in the middle of the unholy instant. I feel like I'm in the middle of a world of chaos and I am floundering. And there is judgment going on in my mind that, that I cannot perce- cannot help but perceive myself as in the mess as long as I'm judging. So everything we do is, is coming to see the miracle as a place of, of seeing the false as false, of seeing the past as past, of seeing that images, any way that they're shaped and formed, any constellation I, I come up with, any way I build my sandcastle, any outcomes that I think will give me peace and happiness, that, that, that they won't, that there will be no happiness in the wrong mind, but only from above the battlefield where I, will I have peace. Something that's coming up, what Bev said um, about not, in other words, sort of taking over in the moment and not allowing the miracle to come through me, not listening you know, that's another thing that sort of I've been struggling with. There's two things going on within me. I either have intense weakness and feeling a victim is, that I'm a victim, or intense power and feeling like I've got the authority. You know, there's something going on here. And so, every, you know, what you're saying, what I, what there's something in there that's saying that there's something, I don't know if it's in the middle or what, you, you can't, you don't have all the authority. But the strength that is within you comes from the Christ that you really need to listen to. So you don't have weakness either. But what Bev was saying is, is, 
you know, 